John's Gospel, chapter 2. We've come to verse 12. And uh, remember, Jesus, as he starts his earthly ministry, he um, first miracle he does is the, he goes to the wedding at Cana. And there's no wine. They run out of wine. And it was kind of a... Um, it was a black mark on the, the host of the, the wedding and on the family if there, was, if there was no wine and you ran out. You could run out of food, but you couldn't run out, run out of wine. And then Jesus' mother comes to him and she says, she says, well, you basically, can you do something about this? Can you, can, you, can you get something going here? Can you do something? And she says, um, he says to her, what am I going to do with you, woman? It was a, he meant it nicely. He goes, my hour has not yet come. But she knew that he was going to do something. She knew that when there was a pressing need, that her son was going to do something. And she had been waiting for him, you know, being a special young man, you know, obviously born of a virgin and growing up in relative obscurity, waiting for him to see what he was going to do. And as he gets baptized in the Jordan, she realized, okay, now he's going to start his earthly ministry. And he goes to this wedding at Cana, and she's like, all right, now, now he can do something. Now he can really make himself known. And he kind of does this miracle, and nobody really knows about it except for the servants who help out. And then as he moves from there, at the beginning of his his earthly ministry, he goes into the temple. And he does this twice, at the beginning of his earthly ministry and at the end of his earthly ministry. And he goes in to to look look around at what's going on. He goes in to worship during the Passover season, and then... He doesn't like what he sees, okay? And that's where we pick it up in verse 12. He travels to Capernaum, then he comes back down to Jerusalem. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother, his brethren, his disciples, and they continued there not too long, not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the the changers' money and overthrew the tables. Now he goes in. Now I'm sure, you know, again, he has his early disciples following him. And they're watching him. And they watch him as he goes into the temple. They're watching what he's doing. And he, and, and he gets aside and he starts to make a, a whip. Okay? And I'm sure they're wondering, okay, what is he, what's he doing? What's going on with this? What's he making a, a, a whip for and a scourge? Why is he, you know, what is he going to do? What, what's, what is going on? And obviously when he goes in, what he sees angers him. He's not happy. And it was a sad situation. It was called the Bazaar of Annas, and what, what Annas came up with and the high priests in that day is they, they came up with a way to take advantage of the people, to merchandise the people, to get the people to give them money. And they used God's house, God's religion to do it. And it's sad and it's scary and it goes on in the body of Christ everywhere. It happens all the time. People are promised something, they're promised this, they're promised healing, they're promised health, promised prosperity, promised eternal life, promised that the, the souls of their loved ones who are in purgatory somewhere will go to heaven, or if, if you give this and if you give somebody that, and it's all lies. And it's not scriptural. It's sad because the The network kind of there of what they were doing wasn't the evil, it was the heart behind it. They had a good little system set up in the sense that you had to bring your sacrifice, it had to be without blemish, it had to be pure, it had to be clean. And sometimes that was hard for the people to bring their sacrifices, you know, sometimes hundreds of miles. So they came up with something good, but they used it to take advantage and hurt the people. And people would come in with their sacrifice. And first of all, you had to exchange money. You had to go and exchange your money for Hebrew money, the Hebrew shekel. And they would take a little bit off the top there in the the exchange rates. And then from there, again, if you were buying your sacrifice and if it was a a dove, if you were poor, again, again, I'll use the terminology of our day, 
For doves, five dollars, they were charging sixty-five. Sometimes it was ten to one. Some commentators said fourteen to one or fifteen to one. And and what the priest was supposed to do is they were supposed to examine that sacrifice to see if it was without spot or blemish. And it just so happens when you brought yours, knowing as you're making your way there, man, I can't. I gotta. This is the way it's got to be done. You know, and (laughs) they're gonna find something. They're gonna find something wrong with my dove. Something wrong with my lamb. Something wrong with my. My bull. So they're going to find something wrong and they're going to take advantage of me. They're going to do something. But you had to go that way to worship God. And it was sad. And it was scary. But you know what it makes me think of though? And they did. They took advantage of the people with their inspections of the sacrifices, with the inspections of what they, what they were bringing, of their doves, of their lambs, of their bulls, of their rams. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I found, there's a hair out of place here. There's something missing. It's got a dew claw. It's got this. It's got that. It's got a little nick in its ear. And they always seem to find something. And then they would give them their replacement. And if I'm looking at the replacement, I'm saying, man, this, this replacement's not much better than the one I brought in. But you really couldn't say anything. You know what it makes me think of, though? Sometimes we can get like that. We can get like the religious leaders who when people are trying to find the Lord Jesus Christ, they're trying to find God, they're coming in and they're trying to make a sacrifice, an offering of praise, an offering of their life, an offering of thanksgiving, an offering of whatever it is. And sometimes we who have been around for a while, we just want to find something. We want to find something. I want to tell you something. If you look hard enough, you can always find something. You know that, right? If you really examine long enough, examine my life or anybody's life, you can always say, hey, hey, yeah, there's something going on there. Something's missing there. They don't really mean it. They don't really want to bring a sacrifice to the Lord. They don't really want to give to the Lord. They don't really want to surrender anything to the Lord. They don't really want to serve. If you look hard enough, you can always find something. See, but that's not the heart of God at all. We get like that. We get like the religious leaders. We've been doing this Christian thing for a while and instead of just continuing to look within on what we need to change. And this is what I always say. When you hear the word of God, don't hear it for other people. Don't hear it for other people. If you're sitting there saying, oh, I hope they hear this. I hope she hears that. I hope she gets, you know, this is what husbands and wives do. If you get that, you better be hearing that. You hearing that? Make sure you listen to that one. When you do that, they're going to stop listening, just so you know. But when you hear the word of God, hear it for yourself. Hear it for yourself. We need to stop worrying about, oh, there's something out of place. There's something missing. There's something here. There's something there. Because we're doing the same thing that these religious leaders were doing. Trying to find something that was off. Trying to find something out of place. And of course, they always found it because they were trying to take advantage of the people. We need not be like that. So when he goes in, it says, he found them in the temple, those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. Again, the system was good, but the heart behind it was wrong. When he had made a scourge scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. Now listen, I think anger was kind of the right response here toward these priests. And I I think it was good. I think it was the right response. And I think, you you know, you kind of don't have a heart for people if if you see people taking advantage of people in the name of God and it doesn't affect you at all, really. But I want to say this to you. We need to do our best as God's people to make sure that it's, it's God that's getting angry first and it's God that's doing the judging first and it's God that's being, you know, pouring out the righteous indignation, that it's God doing that first. Because sometimes we get so filled up. It's, a, it's our job to protect the people. It's our job to fight back. It's our job. Well, it's our job to stand on the truth, yes. 
But don't you remember, as you read through the Scriptures, remember Moses? Moses thinks he's, you know, he's been walking with the Lord. He's been being used of the Lord for quite, a, you know, quite some time now. And uh, the people are whining and complaining again. And they say, you know, Moses, you know, where's, the, where's God? He brought us out here to kill us. You know, we're thirsty again. What are we going to do? And God tells Moses the second time, speak to the rock and I'll bless the people with water. And Moses is angry at the people now. He's been with them for years now. And they've complained, they've rebelled against Moses, against Aaron, against the Lord, over and over again. But finally, Moses thinks that he's the one that can, you know, stand in the place of God. He thinks he's the one that can get angry with the people. Remember what happens? God tells him, speak to the rock. I'm going to have mercy on them, and I'm going to give them water from the rock. And then Moses, what does he do? He gets angry rebellious people and he smites the rock twice and he beats it god still blessed the people and he gave them water but you know what god said to moses moses you didn't sanctify me in the eyes of the people you didn't show me as the holy and the righteous one you thought you were moses you thought you had the right to get angry with those people moses and he said moses because of that now you can't go into the promised land you can only see it afar off. See, but Moses had been walking with the Lord for a while. He had been doing it for a while. He had been rebelled against. He had been turned on. He'd been stabbed in the back many times. And he thought finally now it was his time to get angry with the people. And God said, no, it's not your time. If anyone's going to get angry with the people, it's me, God says, because I'm the holy one, because I see the hearts of man. We need to make sure, because some of us as Christians, we walk around all the time. We're angry at this person. We're angry at that person. We're angry at this church. We're angry at that. We're angry at this. Yes, we're supposed to stand on the truth, but let's make sure it's, it's, we have some love in us. Really. Jesus had the right to get angry. So he made the small cords, the scourge of small cords. He drove them out of the temple. Again, he's just... Cleaning house. And the sheep and the oxen, the animals are running out of their cages, everything else, and the changes of money, are like they're probably on the floor gathering up their, their money and all this stuff. He overthrows these tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, take these things. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. He says, my father's house is, is in a, a, a retail establishment. My father's house is not just a business. My father's house is not a place, it just in the marketplace. And isn't everything so market-driven today? And listen, I'm, I'm not against you know, media and all that stuff. And all that stuff is cool. But when pe And it's good for outreach and all that. But when people come in to a church and we meet together and we gather together, they shouldn't sense just a marketplace. They shouldn't sense just a retail establishment. They should sense that the living God is among us. They should sense that there's people there that are hurting and needy and broken that are trying to find God and there's people there that are willing to minister to them and there's people there that are doing the work of God and the service of God. That's what people should feel when they come into the house of God and they should feel that, hey, there's, there's really people trying to get to know God here. His Father's house is a house of prayer. If you read the other Gospels and weigh Scripture with Scripture. That's what people should sense. It shouldn't be just a place of marketing, a place of merchandise. It's not that. Yes, every religious system, every church, everything, this is all a business side of everything. God And God is okay with that stuff. But it's not a business. It's a business side to things. People are giving their offerings. They're giving their money. They're, they're wanting to do things for God. All that stuff needs to be done decently and in order. But listen, it's for the glory of God. It's for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
People should never get the sense that, hey, we're just running a business here. Because if we're going to just run a business, you know what? Just close up shop and go run a business. God doesn't need that. He wants men and women that are on fire for Him, that are willing to lay down their lives for the cause of Jesus Christ. So when people come in, they can sense that and they can see that. So, He said, get these things out. Take them out. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And His disciples remembered that it was written... The zeal of thine house had eaten me up. Now they remember these things after the fact. If you, if you read through John's gospel, he'll say this often. When Jesus does something, he does a work or he does a miracle or he does a healing or whatever he does, he has a dialogue like he's having here. They remember, oh, the Old Testament pointed to this. And it, it talks about this in, in, in the Psalm, Psalm 69, 9. Oh, when, he can, when, when the Messiah comes, he's going to be zealous for the worship of his father, the worship of God. And they remember that after the fact. And as I read through this and I think about it, and I think about my own life, because the Bible says that our bodies are the temple. The temple of the Holy Ghost. That's who we are. That the living God, when we get saved, comes literally to reside in us and we have a relationship spirit to spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are the sons and daughters of God. And I think about this. And and I think about the fact that Jesus comes in. He came in at the start of my life with Him when I was born again. And He will be there to the end of my life doing what he did in this temple doing what he did in this temple just like he started at the beginning of his earthly ministry he came in and he cleansed that temple and at the end of his earthly ministry right before he was crucified he comes in and he cleanses the temple that's what he does in our lives that's what he does when we believe in jesus he comes in and you know what he starts doing he starts stirring things up He starts knocking tables over. He starts cleansing things. He starts doing those works in our lives, the things that are painful, and and, and it hurts. And sometimes we want to push him out, and we want to push him away, and he keeps coming, and he does not stop. And even though we get like the religious leaders, and we just want to say, you know what? Because I'm going to tell you what happens. The Lord comes in, and he starts to turn tables over in our hearts. He starts to cleanse things. He starts to clear out the greed with the money changers like some of us are still greedy and trusting just in unrighteous money and mammon. He starts to clear those things off. And you know what happens? As he starts to do that in our lives, we get like those religious leaders because we can't handle it, right? And it hurts. And we start to, again, inspect what's going on in everybody else's life. Lord, you're turning this over in my life, but you know what? I can really see... This person sacrificed this person's life. How come you're not doing it in their life? How come it seems like it hurts me so much more? How come it seems like it's so easy for that person and this one and that one? And we start looking out like everybody else, finding again the specks and the blemishes and everybody else because the Lord's coming into our lives and he's flipping tables over and he's clearing off the money changing and he's doing all those things in our lives and things start to scatter. And you know what we start to do when God does that? Can you picture the money changers? What's the first thing they did when that table went over and the money hit the floor? They die for it. They die for it. And then what do they do? They start doing this. And then what, what do they start doing with their eyes? They're looking around now. Don't, hey, that's my, what, hey. That's what, we do the same thing. God comes in and he'll start stirring it up. He'll start flipping tables over. And, and you know, we want to hold on to it. And then we start looking around at everybody else. And what about the sacrifices? The bulls and the doves that are flying away. They're like, wait, 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 wait. Put them back in the cage. But Jesus doesn't stop. Cleanses the temple. He turns everything over. And he says, get out. Take these things hence. Take them away. 
That's what Jesus does in us. And he does not stop. And he will not stop. God needs to, listen, read the book of of Colossians. It says Jesus should have the preeminence, first place in every area of our lives. So if there's any idol in our lives, if there's any high place in our hearts, if there's anything that not, we're not willing to give up, Jesus is not going to stop. He's not going to stop until He cleanses this temple. And He cleanses your temple. Because He needs to be first place. And then listen, just like He started at the beginning of His earthly ministry all the way to the end, He starts it at the beginning of your Christian life all the way to your last breath. And you know what happens? Finally, you just start to learn to get to a place. You say, okay, Lord, i got to surrender it. You've been trying to turn this table over in my life for so long, and I've been just, you know, I've been holding it down. I've been holding on to it, but you finally say, okay, Lord, let it go. And you, sometimes you just let it go. And when you let it go, there's peace. When you let God have his way, there's peace. Because sometimes we're just so fearful. But when God turns those things over in our life, when He cleanses, when He does those works in our lives, He shows Himself strong on your behalf. He comes through for you. He wants you to see that, hey, you didn't need this or you didn't need that. You didn't need that sinful relationship. You didn't need that excess of whatever it was. You didn't need that. You were trusting in that and that was really holding on to you. And when he comes in and he cleanses those things, you say, okay, Lord, now I see that I really didn't need that. I really needed you, Lord. His disciples remember, verse 17, it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews, and they said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that you do these things? They say, now listen, the Bible says the Greeks seek wisdom, the Jews seek a sign. They say, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No one has the authority to do this, these things. We're the religious leaders here. We're the higher ups. We don't even do these things. Who are you? Who are you to think that you can come in here and do these things? And they say, what sign? Show us a sign. Because again, they sought a sign. What sign can you show us to show us that you have the authority to do these things? Now, Jesus did many signs. He did many miracles. Seven of them are are recorded in the Gospel of John. And John tells us that he records only seven to show us specific things about the Lord Jesus Christ that prove that he is the Son of God. In all the Gospels, there's 36 altogether miracles and signs that Jesus does. John chooses only seven. So he does many signs, many miracles. And now, again, 36 are recorded. He probably did many, many, many more than that. He tells us at the, he tells us at the end of the Gospel of John, many other things did Jesus in, in his life that if I could tell you, if I could write them down, all the books that were ever written up to that time couldn't contain what we saw in Jesus Christ. And they're asking him, give us a sign. Do something. To show us that you have the authority to do these things. Now, he's going to tell them what kind of sign he is going to give them. But they ask him, basically, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are coming in here and doing this? And this is what Jesus says. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, listen. We know he's going gonna to tell us he's talking about the temple of his body. But of course, their mind goes right to their own earthly temple. And then look what they say to him. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building. Will you rear it up in three days? 46 years. And listen, this was one of the marvels of the ancient world. The temple, it was beautiful. It was huge, overlaid with gold. The, the, it was unbelievable. It was something people traveled from miles around, whether they were believers in Judaism or not, just to see. And they say that when you walked up 
going to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was higher up that you can start to see the temple glistening in the sun. It was amazing. And now they're sitting there saying, well, wait a minute. You know, now you're a construction worker. You're going to knock this place down and build it in three days. Are you, are you crazy? What are you talking about? Now, the, the word temple he uses here, it, it's a little bit different. And they don't catch on to it. He uses the word holy of holies. So they would have caught on to that because they're thinking of the holy of holies in the temple. But what he's talking about is his holy of holies. He's talking about his body. And he goes, do you want a sign? I'm going to give you a sign. And this is the sign. You're going to destroy this temple. You're going to destroy me. And in three days, I'm going to rise again. I'm going to raise it up. That's the sign. Now listen, that's, the, that's still the sign today. You know that, right? That's still the sign today. Whether God does miracles or not, whether he heals the blind cleanses the lepers, heals the sick, does all those things, and God can do all those things, the real sign that people need, what people really need to see and really need to believe is that Jesus died and Jesus rose again. That's the gospel. That's it. And Jesus tells them, this is the sign. This is it. Destroy this temple. In three days, I will raise it up. I will rise again. He's saying to them, I'm going to take all your sins away. And you guys destroying me. But you know what? I'm going to take them away. And to prove to you that I'm going to take them away, I'm going to raise up again. I'm going to rise again. That's the gospel. See, that's the sign that people need. People need to know about what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for them. People need to know that Jesus died for them. People need to know that Jesus rose again for them. And he goes, this is the sign that I'm giving to you. Destroy this temple in three days. I'll raise it up. Said the Jews, 46 years, this temple wasn't building. Will you rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, here it is again, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture. So they didn't get it until after the resurrection either. And the word which Jesus had made. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, this isn't too long after, many believed in his name, listen to this, when they saw the miracles which he did. Now, again, how many did he do? I, we don't know. But listen to what it says. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in Man. So Jesus comes in to the temple, makes a whip. The disciples saying, what's he doing? He drives out the people. He drives out the money changes. He drives out the sacrifices. Everything starts to scatter. They ask him, now there's a big ruckus going on. Who do you think you are? What is going on? Give us a sign. He goes, no sign. Here's the sign. Destroy this temple in three days. I'll raise it up. And then he goes, and it's the Passover time, and he goes, and he starts to work some miracles. We don't know exactly what he does. And it says, many believe in him. But listen, it says that he didn't commit himself to them. He didn't commit himself to them because it says he knew what was in man. You know what it's saying? Listen, why doesn't he commit himself to them? Yeah, and they don't... <laughs> And he, he knows he can't trust them. He knows he can't trust them. He knows that they're, they, they got some faith going there because of the miracles. Wow, look at this. Maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe this is the Son of God. Maybe it is. And he, he doesn't commit himself to them. He knows what's in man. See, you know what? This gives me a lot of hope. A lot of peace. Because Jesus knows what's inside of me. And Jesus knows what's inside of you. And Jesus knows your faith. And Jesus knows how much you can handle. And Jesus knows that there's sometimes that you're not going to hold on to your faith. And you're not going to believe. And you're going to be faithless. And you're going to be like the disciples. Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. Well, do you believe or not? 
And he doesn't commit himself unto them because he knows what's in man. Listen. Jesus knows what's in me. He knows what's in you. He knows what's in man. And the awesome thing for me is this, is that even though we trust Him, and even though we say we trust in Him, it's not our trust in Him and it's not our faith in Him that keeps us at all. Because I say this all the time. If I had to hold on to my salvation, I'd lose it every day. Every day. I'd be praying the sinner's prayer 27 times a day. Lord, forgive my sins. Come into my heart. You know, I believe in you. Can I have eternal life? Thank you, Jesus. But it doesn't matter that we, <laughs> we trust Him and He can't trust us. It really doesn't matter. And that's awesome for me. That He doesn't have to trust me. Really. He doesn't have to commit Himself to me. Now, we know, I know He's committed Himself to me and dying for me on the cross. But as I'm walking through my life, He doesn't have to trust me that I'm not going to falter, I'm not going to fail. He doesn't have to trust me. Oh, I trust you this time, Matt. I trust you this time that you're going to get it right. I trust you that you're going to really walk with me this time. I trust you that you're going to do the right thing at home. I trust you that you're going to do the right thing over there. I, I really trust you. Nope. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The only thing I had to trust is Him with my salvation. That's it. That's it. And that little simple faith, that little simple trust, you know what? Even though I'm untrustworthy and so are you a lot of times in your life, it doesn't matter. We're secure in Jesus Christ. Because you know why? Because the Father trusted Him to take all your sin to the cross. And He did. And that's why it doesn't matter He commits Himself to me because He can't trust me. And He can't trust you. It doesn't matter because the Father trusted the Son to do what the Son only could do for you. And He did it for you. <laughs> 